Scene 14, the same. Enter Faustus with the scholars. Ah, gentlemen, what ails Faustus? Ah, my sweet chamber fellow, had I lived with thee, then had I lived still. But now I die eternally. Look, comes he not? Come he not? What means Faustus? Belike he has grown into some sickness by being over solitary. If it be so, we'll have physicians to cure him. Tis but a surfeit. Never fear, man. A surfeit of deadly sin that hath damned both body and soul. Yet, Faustus, look up to heaven. Remember, God's mercies are infinite. But Faustus's offenses can never be pardoned. The serpent that tempted Eve may be saved, but not Faustus. Ah, gentlemen, hear me with patience, and tremble not at my speeches. Though my heart pants and quivers to remember that I have been a student here these thirty years, oh, what I have never seen Wittenberg, never read book, and what wonders I have done, all Germany can witness, yea, the world, for which Faustus hath lost both Germany and the world, yea, heaven itself, heaven, the seat of God, the throne of the blessed, the kingdom of joy, and must remain in hell for ever. Hell, ah, hell for ever, sweet friends. What shall become of Faustus being in hell forever? Now, let's look at a few things that we just read here. If you just look up to the scholar, number one, and his second line there, if it be so, we'll have physicians to cure him, tis but a surfeit, uh, never fear, man. A, a surfeit, it's, that's just, you know, it's a minor thing is what he's trying to communicate to them. This is a minor issue. And then Faustus is reminded by the second one, the second scholar, to look up to heaven and to remember that God's mercies are infinite. And yet Faustus, so high on pride here, feels that his sin is greater than the first sin that was committed, greater even than the instigator of the first sin, the serpent, when he alludes to Adam and Eve's you know, uh, end of time in paradise by the serpent and the temptation from the knowledge of the, you know, by eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's interesting in and of itself. And yet he goes on to say he wished he had never read a book and that all the world knows all the great deeds that he's done. And yet the price of all of this has been to give up heaven, to give up heaven forever and be in hell forever. And he's asking him, oh no, what's going to become of me, right? Well, the third scholar says, yet Faustus, call on God. On God, whom Faustus hath abjured? On God, whom Faustus hath blasphemed. Ah, oh, my God, I would weep, but the devil draws in my tears. Gush forth blood instead of tears, yea, life and soul. Oh, he stays my tongue. I would lift up my hands, but see, they hold them, they hold them. And, of course, everybody's like, who, Faustus? <laughs> Lucifer and Mephistopheles, ah, gentlemen, I gave them my soul for my cunning. God forbid. God forbade, indeed, but Faustus hath done it. For vain pleasure of twenty-four years hath Faustus lost eternal joy and felicity. I writ them a bill with mine own blood. The date is expired. The time will come, and he will fetch me. Why did not Faustus tell us this before? That divines might have prayed for thee. Oft have I thought to have done so. But the devil threatened to tear me in pieces if I named God, to fetch body, both body and soul, if I once gave ear to divinity. And now tis too late. Gentlemen, away, lest you perish with me. Oh, what shall we do to save Faustus? Talk not of me, but save yourselves and depart. God will strengthen me. I will stay with Faustus. Tempt not God, sweet friend, but let us into the next room and there pray for him. Aye, pray for me. Pray for me. And what noise soever ye hear, Come not unto me, for nothing can rescue me. Pray thou, and we will pray that God may have mercy upon thee. Gentlemen, farewell. If I live till morning, I'll visit you. If not, Faustus is gone to hell. Faustus, farewell. And the scholars leave, and this clock strikes eleven. Now, if we flit our eyes back up to the top of the page, you'll see... He says, Faustus hath blasphemed, you know, he's sinned, he's, you know, taken, gone against the word of God, gone against heaven's wishes, right? 
And he says, ah, my God, I would weep, but the devil draws in my tears. So it's interesting here because he's saying he would beg for forgiveness, essentially, but the devil owns him. Now, this is his perception. At this point, he can still repent. He's living. He's breathing. He can pray to God, ask for forgiveness, beg for mercy, and be forgiven. And yet, he does not. You know, and he says, God forbade it indeed, but Faustus hath done it. So, that right there, he scorned God. He you know, flew in the face of God to do this. And he's so enraptured by his own importance, his, the severity of his own sin, that he doesn't realize that no sin is too great. No sin is beyond forgiveness. And he's, you know, further on he says, Oft have I thought to have done so, but the devil threatened to tear me in pieces if I named God. And so he wants to be sure that no one but himself pays the price because he goes on and says, hey, you know, you guys leave, gentlemen, away, lest you perish with me. So th that in its sense is, that in, a, in and of itself is a noble quality. Once again, we see, you know, our conflicted hero, you know, very much a tragic hero. And he tells them to save themselves and depart. But let's take a look at, you know, he threatened to tear him in pieces if I named God. Now, that may be true. He may be torn to pieces, but his soul would be saved forever if he asks for God's help. So, much like we just saw with the old man, the old man's body was ripped and shredded and torn. And he was killed, but that doesn't mean very much at all. And even Mephistopheles admits that himself. It's not much to tear somebody's body apart because their soul is everlasting. And to something that exists eternally and something that can grasp and grapple with the concept of eternity, death of the body is nothing. It's death of the soul that matters, which Faustus mentioned, if you recall, in the very beginning of the play when he speaks of theology and he talks about how we all must sin and he has his little syllogism there and he explains everything. So we, we come back to him again, believing that it's, it's past. He, there's nothing that can be done. He, there's no hope left for him. And so the scholars go into the next room to pray for him and he says, hey, if you don't see me in the morning, I'm in hell. Well, and then the clock strikes 11. Ah, Faustus... Now hast thou but one bare hour to live, and then thou must be damned perpetually. Stand still, you ever-moving spheres of heaven, that time may cease at midnight never come. Fair nature's eye rise, rise again and make perpetual day. Or let this hour be but a year, a month, a week, a natural day, that Faustus may repent and save his soul. O oh, lente, lente, curete noctis equi. And this is from one of Ovid's love poems, you know, run softly, softly, horses of the night. And it, it comes from Ovid's Amores, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, which is an excellent piece to read, by the way. It fits in so beautifully with the way this last section of Faustus's time in the play is drawn about and comes about. It is worth reading. As a matter of fact, why don't we take a look at it just briefly here. Now she rises over the ocean, come from her aged husband, the golden girl who brings day to the frozen sky. Why hurry, Aurora? Wait. So the bird, Memnon, shade, can perform the annual sacrificial rite. Now I delight to lie in my girl's soft arms. Now she's so sweetly joined to my side. Okay, so you can see this is a book one elegy, The Dawn. This whole piece is about how he doesn't wish the dawn to come. Why does dawn have to happen so early? Why does daytime always have to show up and ruin the bliss, the sweet peace of night? And he goes on to malign and speak, you know, illy of dawn and, you know, what, what she's really up to. It's really a very beautiful piece, but I, I suggest you read it sometime. This one is from uh, poetryintranslation.com, and it's decent. It's good. I, I have no problem with it. I think it's a Decent translation, free and easily accessible. Now, back to our play. 
Actually, this might be a good time to take a brief pause, and we'll pick up with the next lecture.